But try telling that to China. Beijing doesn't believe in multipolarity or division of powers. They want to be the top dog. Like all big powers before them, China is starting with the neighborhood. That's Central Asia. Xi Jinping is hosting a two-day summit. Leaders from all five Central Asian countries are attending. Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan. All five are former Soviet states. Hence, all of them have traditionally been closer to Russia. Central Asia is often called Russia's backyard. But China wants to change that. So Xi Jinping is throwing a grand party in Xi'an. And the choice of the venue is important, the city of Xi'an. Xi'an was the easternmost point of the ancient Silk Road. It's no secret that China wants to revive it. The Belt and Road Project, BRI, is often billed as the new Silk Road. Either way, the events in Xi'an were grand. You had dance performances, songs from Central Asia, light shows. It was less of a summit and more of a charm offensive. Perhaps that was the idea all along. To show Central Asia the difference between China and Russia. One is stuck in Ukraine, the other is throwing lavish parties. But charm cannot replace substance. So Xi Jinping whipped out the checkbook as well. He announced a development project worth $3.8 billion. There is a proverb popular among farmers in Shangxi province. If you work hard enough, gold will grow out of the land. In the same vein, a Central Asian saying goes, you get rewarded if you give and you harvest if you sow. Let us work closely together to pursue common development, common affluence and common prosperity and embrace a brighter future for our six countries. So why is Xi Jinping trying to snatch Russia's allies? There are three major reasons. Number one, the location. Central Asia can be China's bridge to Europe. It's a key part of the Belt and Road project. Number two, the resources. Central Asia is home to vast oil and gas reserves, around 31 million barrels of oil and 825 trillion cubic feet of gas. These resources could end China's dependence on ship-borne oil. China may not control the seas, but they could control the land routes over Central Asia. And reason number three is security. Peace in Central Asia is key to peace in Xinjiang. China has jailed around 1 million Uyghurs in the province. But they fear an insurgency. And Xinjiang borders three Central Asian states. So trouble there could mean trouble in Xinjiang. Until now, Russia was in charge of Central Asian security, but Moscow is busy in Ukraine now. Thus, how long can China count on another country? So Xi Jinping wants to take charge. He wants to make inroads into Central Asia. The question is, will those countries play along? They certainly need the money. China's investments could help them expand their infrastructure. They also need security guarantees. Three Central Asian countries are treaty allies of Russia. Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Russia is bound to deploy troops there if the government's request. That's the treaty. It has already done so in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Will China be willing to do the same or even offer that? The fact is, historic alliances are hard to break. China may end up making inroads into Central Asia, but replacing Russia is going to take time. And don't forget, Central Asia has other options. In the month of March, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken visited the region. So did European Union President Charles Michel last year. Everyone is courting Central Asia. Where does that leave Moscow? Putin knows he can't beat the Chinese checkbook. So what does he do? He widens the, the competition pool. It was Russia that proposed India's membership in the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, or SCO. Now it wants Iran and Belarus to join. Do you see the strategy here? Russia is using other Asian powers to check China's influence. Nothing new, though. Every country does it, which is why Xi Jinping is betting on a direct approach. He says these Central Asian summits will be held every two years. The next one will be in 2025. Kazakhstan will be hosting it. If Putin and Xi are willing to share power in Central Asia, this wouldn't be a problem. But Putin doesn't seem like someone who shares. Let's not forget why he invaded Ukraine. So this summit may not signal a break in China-Russia ties, but it does expose the challenges. 50% and 15%. Similar sounding numbers, but they're obviously different. And for Spain, that has become a big problem. I'll explain. 
The government held a survey. It was about unpaid work, you know, routine activities like cooking, cleaning, childcare. Both men and women participated in the survey. About 50% women said they do most of the housework. What about men? 15%. It's a stark disparity, but it's not shocking. We'll tell you why, but first let's tell you what Spain is planning to do about it. They're trying to solve this old school problem with a modern day tool, an app. They're launching an app for household chores. You can divide housework among members of your family and monitor who is doing what. A lot like those expense sharing apps that we all use. Except here, men and women can log in the hours they spend doing housework. How will it help? The government says it will make the division equitable because when you see a problem, it's hard to turn a blind eye. The idea seems interesting, but does Spain like it? The response has been mixed so far. Some people are angry and offended. The government says that's because they'll have to start doing their share of the work. Others have welcomed this app. And this is a big deal in Spain because unpaid work is a major issue there. It has led to legal battles. Divorce cases are being settled with huge bills. Men are being asked to pay for years of unpaid work to their ex-wives. In 2017, a man had to pay about $25,000 for the same. Earlier this year, a man was asked to pay some $220,000, that's more than 1.7 crore rupees, for unpaid housework. How do they arrive at these numbers? On the basis of minimum wage. Had these women been paid a minimum wage for the work they do at home, this is the money they would have earned. And Spain is taking this very seriously. We say kudos to them and a learning for the rest because the problem of unpaid work is not limited to this country. Around the world, men and women spend their time differently. Men spend more time working for money. Women work, but often do not get paid for it. And this is not a general assumption. It's, ba it's backed by data. On average, women spend about five hours a day on unpaid housework, while men spend just an hour doing housework. Women also do 76% of all unpaid care work the world over, 76%. These numbers are a world average. Country-wise, they look very different. In some countries, men and women share the load, more equitably, like Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Canada, and Finland. Here, two women work more, but about one hour more than men on doing daily chores. Elsewhere, the picture looks grim, like in Japan, Mexico, Portugal, Turkey, and India. In all of these countries, women spend over three hours more than men on chores. In India, the number is five hours, that amounts to 1,825 hours in a year. Let me repeat that. In India, women do household work for over 1,800 hours, more than men, every year. That's a lot of time and effort spent on unpaid work. And the value of this work remains largely invisible to economists. It is not part of GDP calculations. It is not used to measure economic growth. It is also difficult to value. But today, let's try to put it in terms of money. In 2019, if women earned minimum wage for their unpaid work, they would have earned about $11 trillion the world over. $11 trillion. It's more money than the 50 biggest companies of the world made that year combined. So basically, it's a lot of money. Even in cases where both men and women have a day job, it's the women who do more housework. Even when women earn more money than their male partners, they do more housework. Among retirees, women do more housework. Among the non-employed, take a while guests, women do more housework. I can literally turn this into a poem or a rap even, whatever you prefer. Because this is my only point. The quiet cost of unpaid work. And this is not just about lost money. It's also about high rates of burnout, stress, depression, anxiety, insomnia, and other such problems among women. And no, housework is not the only reason for those problems, but it adds to them. So what can you do? Well, share the load and spread the message at a personal level, at a policy level, like the chore distribution app in Spain or China's legal right to seek compensation for unpaid work or Sweden's parental leave policy or Denmark's subsidized daycare policy. These are all good first steps, but governments can do a lot more to address the issue of unpaid work to help us see this invisible work and assign it the value that it deserves. Think about it. If the UK's parliament were a rapper, it would probably say something like this. I've got 99 problems and my home's the latest one. 
because the UK Parliament just added a new problem to its long list of issues. It now has a structural problem. No, I'm not talking about bickering parliamentarians. I'm referring to the very structure of the parliament. It is the seat of British democracy, a UNESCO site hailed as an architectural masterpiece, which has, quote unquote, a real and rising risk of destruction because it is crumbling and leaking. It has a perpetual threat of fire, also a clear risk of history repeating itself. What am I talking about? Our next report tells you. This is Britain's Parliament building, the Palace of Westminster, located in central London. Built in the 19th century, visited by one million people per year. A UNESCO site, often called an architectural marvel. Lots of random facts about this Gothic building, right? You must be wondering why we're giving you an information overload. We're simply trying to prep you for a dark twist. Because while this parliament was built to hold the UK together, now its own building is coming down. The UK parliament is crumbling, leaky and at a constant risk of fire. With 44 fire incidents since 2016, its pipes are bursting and it's dropping masonry. Yes, chunks of the building are literally falling off. Electrical systems were last updated in the 1940s and the building is riddled with asbestos, which is a building material. It was popular in the early 1800s, not so much anymore, because it's hazardous to health. Inhaling it can cause lung diseases like cancer and this asbestos is present in about 2,500 locations in the building. All of this and more has recently come to light in a hair-raising report released by the British House of Commons. And it says that a catastrophic event will destroy this building before long delayed restoration work is done. By the sounds of it, this issue is pretty urgent. A burning issue to avoid a literal fire, if we may say so. Question is, will the UK pay heed to this report? Because, as you can tell, the damage is big, vast, and there's nothing new about it. There have been several warnings before, and there was also renewal work, but it's painfully slow. And it's mostly limited to patching up the place, which is done at about $2.5 million a week. Then there's also been a lot of back and forth. In 2018, lawmakers finally voted to move out of the building. They were going to do it by mid-2020 to make way for years worth of repairs. But there is no certainty, because lawmakers don't want to move. Last year, a body was set up to oversee the repairs, but it was scrapped. So while the dithering continues, the building grows more decrepit. Some don't want to leave this historic building with its riverside terrace and subsidized restaurants. And some lawmakers are worried about the public's disapproval towards a multi-billion dollar bill of repairs. Especially when people in the UK are struggling to make ends meet. But if they continue to wait, what's about to come will be even more costly to the taxpayers. Because history is not without warnings. This parliament's predecessor was destroyed in a fire in 1834. If that isn't enough, the Britons could learn from the 2019 fire in France's Notre Dame. So there are surely warnings, both in history and in lengthy reports published by Parliament committees, out of which this week's report is the most urgent. Hopefully, the lawmakers will see it that way. And if they're still struggling, here's a helpful Friday night tip for them. If it's money the lawmakers are trying to save, wasting time and avoiding action is never value for money. Now let's talk about Elon Musk. He seems to be taking more interest in India. A few days back, he was praising Indian food. Now his car company, Tesla, is making moves here. Tesla wants to build a factory in India. They're reviving their India plans. Reports say the company has written to the government of India. It says Tesla is willing to make electric cars in India. They'll be sold in the domestic market. They'll also be exported overseas. Senior officials from Tesla have visited India, we understand. They've held talks with the government. They're exploring ways to operate here. Nearly one year ago, Tesla had abandoned its plans for India. It wrapped up its operations and left the country. Then why the change of heart? In fact, the change of strategy too. Earlier, they wanted to sell imported cars in India. But the import tax was too high. Tesla pushed, but Delhi did not budge. Elon Musk even took to Twitter to complain. It changed nothing. 
India said Tesla should manufacture in India. It would get subsidies and discounts if it does this. But Tesla just packed up and left. Now they've returned and are talking to the government. They're talking about setting up a factory, sourcing parts for cars in India, even making batteries here. The conversations happened earlier this week and they're still in the initial stages. Reports say Tesla has not presented a concrete plan yet. It's looking for relief on tariffs, for less import tax on cars. But the government has refused any concession. This tax regime applies to all automakers. India won't make an exception for Tesla. If the company wants to be in India, they'll have to commit fully. So they're still negotiating. Tesla is reaching out to key ministries, like the Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, Power and Heavy Industries. It doesn't help that Elon Musk is a mercurial leader. In the past, he's been critical of India. He said the Indian market is challenging and that import taxes are too high. In January last year, when asked about Tesla's plans for India, Musk said, and I'm quoting, still working through a lot of challenges with the government. He posted this on Twitter. It made a lot of waves. The taxes are more or less the same. What has changed, though, is the geopolitical situation. There is a war in Europe. Russia is under sanctions. Countries and companies are de-risking and decoupling from China. So everyone is looking for alternatives. Tesla will have to do the same. As of now, their biggest manufacturing hub in this region is in China. They have a factory in Shanghai. It pr produces 22,000 vehicles a week. But tensions remain high between the U.S. and China. They're fighting a trade war. Washington is firing more sanctions at Beijing, so American businesses depending solely on China face newer risks. They must diversify. Tesla realizes this, hence the outreach to India. Last November, Elon Musk said he considers South Korea as a top candidate for investment. Then in January, Tesla turned to Indonesia. They're said to be close to a deal with Indonesia. They'll set up a factory there. The plan is to produce one million cars every year in Indonesia. Where does that leave India? It's a big market and an investment destination. But it's not clear what Tesla plans to do here. What is clear, though, is that Tesla must make in India to be able to sell in India. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We're starting with Italy, where a two-year-old toddler was rescued after being stranded in a flooded building. Tens of thousands of South Korean nurses went on strike after a law to improve their pay was vetoed. And Japanese activists held protests against the G7 Leaders' Summit in Hiroshima. Now, what makes the 19th of May significant? We're taking you back in history to the year 1571. On this day, in 1571, the city of Manila was established by a Spanish explorer named Miguel Lopez. Today, Manila is the capital of the Philippines. We're leaving you with these images. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on Monday.
exchanges from inside the BBC, they talk about the risk of violating Indian laws. It's easier to rake up the freedom of speech debate, but does it give anyone a free pass to knowingly violate the law? America supports India because it needs India's support in return. And India is working with the US because it suits India's interests. This is how geopolitics works. Last night, he diffused a crisis with his defence minister. But today, Netanyahu was confronted with a new problem. His cabinet seems to have rebelled against him. The UK is looking at the Indian subcontinent to fill its coffers. That India seems to be negotiating from a position of power, like a partner and not a former colonist.